exciting to see you again and to also experience the enthusiasm in this room right now. We hope that today is exactly what you are expecting. Um, I'm Jerry Kesky, the PLC coordinator for Math Generation. And so it's my privilege to um, introduce Kevin McDonald, a colleague and director of secondary education for our first session today. Welcome. Thank you. Don't be clapping yet. You've, uh, yeah, I've never talked before this many people, so I don't know if I can move around here. Okay, so the reason why I was picked to do this presentation was because I know Mark Cerruti and my office is next door to his, and I had a free open area on my calendar, so here I am. Um, many people could do this because we're talking about PLCs, and we're talking about expectations versus norms. I love this because being on time, that's a great norm. Be on time. Isn't that supposed to be an expectation? So you have to, when you start talking about norms for your PLC, think about what are expectations and what are norms. For some of you folks, you might have to make that a norm because people aren't always on time. So have you ever been on a dysfunctional team? These are real life teachers that I found <laughs> at Elk Grove <laughs> District. I did snapshots of them when they were forming their PLC, sitting in a staff meeting, and actually I think that occurs at a few district meetings as well. So just for a moment, if you would talk next to you or what you call elbow partners or across the way and talk about things that you've had on a dysfunctional team. I'll share one of mine, which I cannot stand. The person who knows everything but really knows nothing. That's my pet peeve. So that's why I always keep my mouth shut because I know nothing and I know I know nothing. So take a moment, think about dysfunctional teams, what you've experienced with that. You're at time, ladies and gentlemen. If I could have you come back. Obviously, none of you have been on a dysfunctional team because you had nothing to say. So I was charged. I was once, well, I'm not, I don't have time to give you a background, but I'll tell you I did teach elementary at Anna Kirch Gator. And so I didn't want to tell you I used to be the principal of Valley because the elementary would all check out and say I don't know anything. So I know a little bit about elementary. But I did, as principal of the Valley, I did a regional PLC for 6th through 12th grade teachers. Now think about that for a minute. 6th through 12th grade. You know 12th grade teachers believe that no 6th grader knows how to teach a kid. And 6th grade teachers think 12th grade teachers don't know how to teach a kid, they know how to teach content. Let's just break the stereotype down, that's what it is. But they all got together and we created norms and we did a PLC in about three hours. And what we did was an exercise just like this. And they did a gallery walk to see what they came up with. I wonder if you came up with this. Elements of a dysfunctional team, no agenda, no reliability, not prepared, always arriving late, can never make a decision, the know-it-all, I put that one up there. The loudest is the leader. All talk and nothing accomplished. So what they did was they said, these are all the dysfunctions we've seen in PLCs, committee meetings, anything we've been involved with. And so guess what they made for their norms? That became their norms. So they were able to create a norm that they had buy-in to because they were experiences they had already had. So this is how we got teachers from 6th through 12th grade together. Are there any of those teachers here that were involved? There you are. Was it about like that? Yeah. Yeah? All right, good. Oh, I got a thumbs up. Yes. Okay, here's a little exercise for what norms versus expectations are. Norms are part of the culture. They can be ground rules. It can be a behavior contract. Standard of proper or acceptable behavior. Your expectations is that you all have to come to the table with a strong belief that something will happen or be that case in the future. A belief that someone will or should achieve something Something looking forward to, something that's supposed to happen, the probability of an occurrence. So an expectation, you're going to have to probably let your PLC know what the expectation is. Expectation is you're all here because you're interested in all kids achieving to the highest level of their abilities. So you might have to actually spell that out. I know you've never run across a teacher who doesn't subscribe to that theory, but just in case you do, you might want to tell you that's expectation right out there. If you remember when we first had this presentation, I can't remember how long ago it was. Is it the holiday in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, holiday in. 
Mark Cerruti talked about the how, the what, and the why. And he talked about PLCs are an inside out. In other words, you ask about the why. You work around the why. Typically, top down is outside in. This is what you're going to do it. This is how you're going to do it. And then you're sitting in your classroom going, why are we doing this? I wonder how many pre-services you've had where you were told what to do, somebody showed you how to do it, and then somebody expected you to do it all the first week of school, and you sat in your room going, why? I know that never happens, so don't worry about it. So in a PLC, the expectations are the why. That's why you're forming a PLC. The norms are the how. This may not be something you're going to share with your PLCs, but it's something for you to really get embedded in your mind. This is truly something that's driven by you as a PLC. So as you develop your norms, there are categories. There's time and attendance, confidentiality, decision making, participation, and leadership. Time attendance, start and stop time, stay on task, attend all meetings. Those three are just samples. But you really are, well, maybe you're a high-functioning PLC. Any PLC I've ever been in, I've got to set the time. I also have to set the time on when we're going to end. Because that person who's talking the loudest at 4 o'clock and it's supposed to end at 4 o'clock, I can cut them off and say, bam, we're done. Sorry, that was our time. And attend all meetings. I need to let you know that when I was principal, two people on a team of about 15 could never attend all meetings, so I told them not to come anymore. They don't have to come ever again. They get that late start Wednesday time is all theirs. Do whatever they want to do. Do you remember the inference of, what was it called? Do you remember the scale Mark Sri really talked about? You can get the first 15% on, but it's the next 32%. Tell me you remember that. Yeah. Okay. They were obviously that 32%, those two people. So I kicked them out of the PLC for their own good because they didn't want to be there anyway. They kept coming. But they were always on time and they did everything we asked for the norms. Next is confidentiality. You want to stay on task. Focus on what you have control over. I helped start a PLC at another, at another school. <laughs> One of the things they put down for their SMART goals, the reason why the kids were not achieving, you already know why. It's a big surprise. I can close the achievement gap right now. You want to know why? Because they don't come prepared. The parents don't care. They don't feed them. The grade level before didn't do what they were supposed to do. And they're too immature. That was literally on their SMART goal. And so we let them roll with it. And at the end, of course, they didn't achieve their SMART goal. So rather than set that norm, they had already had that preconceived idea that it wasn't our fault. So we let them go through the process. And that's what I like about PLCs. No one's telling you to have a PLC in place tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. It may take you more time as you set up your norms. Next is decision making. You've got to have a way to make a decision. Otherwise, that person who talks the loudest or has more positional power, or it's that 12th grade teacher, they're the ones that get to make all decisions. In that 6 through 12 PLC I talked to you about, to my surprise, 6th grade teachers wanted to know what they had to prepare their kids for for the Casey exam. And I was thought, well, aren't you concerned about the standards your principal's telling you your kids have to reach proficient on at the sixth grade grade level? And they said, yes, but they're lying to Casey. We want those are our kids. So if you want to see high school teachers here, elementary teachers, say that it really was a joint learning experience for everybody. But they had a clear decision-making consensus. They also used data to drive decisions. We had a long conversation today at the district office with a number of folks and the conversation was around, how do we know this is going to work? How do we know this has not worked in the past? How do we know it will work? Because we all have a thousand great ideas. Raise your hands if you have an idea how to close the achievement gap. Nobody? Thank you. She just got superintendent. She's the only one to raise their hand. It cracks me up that every interview for an administrator, they ask you, what strategies would you use to close the achievement gap? And every administrator who's gotten a job has answer, answered that correctly, including myself. But the achievement gap still exists. So somebody please tell me what's going wrong. One, one reason why, not the only reason, 
because a lot of our decisions aren't made by data. So a little bit later you're going to hear about how we make those decisions, but think about this in your PLC. You know it's really, really important that every kid has the proper materials. That's how you're going to close the gap. That's how you're going to get kids to learn math. They have to have the proper materials. You also know they have to be in class. You also know they have to be engaged. We can name 35 more. How do you know which one has to be done first? First and foremost. Because I can give 35 dogs the newest material on Common Core and they'll never learn it. I can give a group of obedient third graders and give them the wrong material and they won't get it. So how do you make the decision that this is the one thing we have to do right now? Because that's built upon everything else that we're going to do after that. You have to have a decision making process in which to do that. We came out with GER. Everybody worked on GER, am I right? Elementary folks, did you get GER? Okay, sorry, I had to go with secondary that day. GER was meant to support the implementation of Common Core. The question that keeps coming up was, were you ready to put GER in that first day of school? What's GER stand for? Gradual Release of Responsibility. I'm sorry, it's a student engagement practice. So at the high school that I used to be principal at, we said the English department is looking for new strategies to engage students. They are ready to implement it September 1. That strategy, gradual release responsibility. The science department didn't have common assessments. They weren't working as a PLC. And quite frankly, they really didn't like each other. They were not looking for instructional strategies. They were looking for a marriage counselor. So we did not make them do gradual lease of responsibility on September 1st. They were ready for it in November. So it just gives you an example of how your decisions in a PLC have to be well thought out and there'll be a process that will walk you through in a few months on how to do that. It sounds crazy, but you've got to publicize all your decisions to your PLC. You've got to keep reminding them what your decisions are and what your process is for making those decisions. Otherwise, the loudest is the one that makes the decision. Participation, assign roles for folks. Just because you're the one running the PLC, it doesn't mean you can't make that another person a timekeeper. You've got to have somebody that's going to take notes for you because those notes have to be sent out the next day. Somebody should also be working on the agenda because the agenda for your PLC should not be going out the day of the meeting. The whole process behind PLC is to build teacher capacity as leaders. Please keep that in the back of your mind. That is why your association has been working with us on the implementation of PLCs. Leadership. Someone's got to step up and say what you'd say here does not go out in the parking lot. And that's a tough one. It's a really tough one. Comments are confidential. That is really, 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 really hard to do. When you're in a room with people that some you may like and some you don't like and whether or not you're going to say something, you have to subscribe to this. That what you say in there is confidential. I know a very high functioning team, I'm not going to call it a PLC, very high functioning team in a high school. I'll tell you. Valley High School. I'm very proud of the fact that their history scores for two years, their percentage of kids proficient in advance. Now, I know what y'all are thinking when I'm saying Valley High School, so you just keep that stereotype in your mind. The percentage of students proficient in advance in, in history for two years were better than Rio Americano. They were better than Beverly Hills High School. If you didn't hear that, Beverly Hills High School because they had a very, very, very high functioning team. And when I came to them with this concept of PLCs, we don't need it because we beat Beverly Hills High School. So at that point, I had to figure out a new tact. And the day one of their teachers left crying because she was yelled at because her data was so poor, that was my entry level into that department to work on PLCs. So again, that confidentiality piece. 
Norms. Are they done? You did them. You came up with them. You grew them. Now what? Everybody's responsible. You have to evaluate your norms as you go. I love the idea, what do you do when you violate a norm? I don't know what you do when you violate a norm. That depends on you folks. That's a tough one. You'll love the literature. Come up with something fun like a red handkerchief. Are you ready for that? So if somebody does something that's outside of a norm, you throw a handkerchief in the middle of the table? Yeah, I know it wouldn't go well with my teams either. So think about what you're going to use. I'll tell you a department told me that there have, this, this department went to do four training. The four is the one that kind of really has pushed this PLC. They went for a week and they said, we've been working on a year on norms, a year for seven teachers. And when I said, why? They said, because the teachers say, we've been working together for years, we don't need norms. So my question is, why are you spending seven years on norms? Go to the next step, start doing the work, and when you have a problem come up, guess what? That's a norm. The first day somebody doesn't come with their data, oh, there's a norm. So you've got to think about how you're going to use them, when you're going to use them, and how you're going to develop them. And most importantly, your evaluation of your norms. You know when your norms aren't working. That's usually when you're frustrated and say these PLCs are stupid and you're not going to them ever again. That's usually when you realize your norms aren't going to work. So we have a couple of documents that will show you some sample PLC norms. This is a current PLC for school A. Be on time. Use active listening. Actively participate. Respect others' opinions, comments, and ideas. Keep off all cell phones. I'm telling you right now, if I got to do another vice principal training, I'm going to make all vice principals check their phones at the doors. So think about that. Because I cannot stand it when somebody's texting on a phone. Not that I have anything important to say, but to me it's just a respect issue. So if that's one of your norms, you may want to put that in place. Refrain from side conversations. Leave outside work outside. My guess is whatever team did these norms had a problem one time with somebody using the telephone. So that's probably why they put it in there. Here's a little different idea of what norms can be. Start and stop on time, stay on task, attend all meetings. I think that was a pretty high functioning team to begin with. Say what you need to here in the room, not in the parking lot, and individual comments are confidential. You can kind of already see what the, norm, what the PLCs look like before they ever set norms. School A probably had a few issues going on. School B was pretty high functioning. Another sample, start and stop on time, and this is where they kind of have the categories. Stay on task, attend all meetings, encourage listening, discourage interrupting, stay on task, and I won't read the rest of them because you certainly have those in front of you. The only reason why I wanted to show you two is because all of them are different. I showed you the categories, but you, won't, you don't even see any of these that have all the categories. The reason why they're different, because it depends on the makeup of your PLC. How are you going to set your norms, what you want to do. The best way that I've ever had in setting up norms was, and I got a thumbs up, was that 6th through 12th grade teachers, where we made a list of everything we hated about committees, PLCs, meetings we've had. And I said, OK, if we all agree we didn't like these things, then we all agree these will be our norms, we don't do these. And they all said yes. So they all had ownership and buy into it. That is the best way I've ever done norms. I'm sure you're going to be sharing out as time goes on how you've done norms, and it's probably far better than that. But at that point, I just want to give you this brief overview of norms, kind of show how it works with expectations, and I'll let you go on your way. Thank you. So today, we're going to talk a little bit more about choose three ways. How many people have been trying either think, pair, share, or choose three ways? Sweet. You will get a chance in the next breakout session to debrief some of that work that you brought. And what we're going to do in this room is look again at how you can actually get some kids talking in another example on video. But before you do that, we're going to have you do a little math. <laughs> going to have you think about it quietly to yourself in your head, no pencil and paper, just thinking. I hope that didn't make you just nuts. But how many people are a little bit relieved about what sort of problem we'll show by the fact that I said you're not allowed to use a pencil? See there? Yeah, this is a little mental math, okay? So you're just thinking in your head quietly to yourself. What do you think, Fran? Shall we give them um, 30 seconds? 
All right, and then we'll have you turn to an elbow partner or across the table partner or a behind the table partner, I don't care. Talk to somebody, all right, about, and somebody has to listen and somebody has to talk, so don't just both of you start talking and no one's listening, all right? All right, so 30 seconds. So Fran, here's the two fractions. We want to know which, if it's true or false, I think. They're tiny fractions. Which is greater, four sevenths or four ninths is what you're quietly, you guys are doing an excellent job quietly thinking to yourself. And then you can be thinking about which is closer to one and how could you prove it? So now I'm shutting up for your 30 seconds of quiet think time. All right, that was 30 seconds, so if your neighbor is ready to talk. You How many people heard an argument that they believed? Nice, okay, okay. How many people heard the exact same argument as they were thinking when they talked to their neighbors? Ah, so I take it to mean that there was, the opposite is true, that there were people that heard different things. Anybody willing to, um, well, I guess we should decide. How many people think four sevenths is larger? I think that's every hand in the room. All right. So, <laughs> so could somebody get us started on, uh, well, I guess I could ask. How many people think four sevenths is then closer to one? Because if it's larger, it's always closer to one, right? Nice. <laughs> How many people think I could choose two fractions just on the other side of one and just violate the statement I just made about the larger one always yes, being closer to one, right? So yeah, way to, way to catch me, good job. So anybody got a starting, uh, could start us off on a, France got a mic and I got a mic. So you're going over here to Tom? In my group over here, um, one side of the table and did an initial comparison to half. That four as a numerator is more than half of seven and that four as a numerator is less than half of nine. So that was one side of the table. And then on the other side of the table, the initial thought was, since they have the same numerator, that you have to look at the denominators and that sevenths uh, is a larger piece than a ninth. So four sevenths is going to be larger than four ninths. How many people agree with both of those arguments? How many people would be really happy if we actually had student work in front of us if a kid get, gave either one of those answers and they'd put it in the got it pile? How many people think that would be a nice thing? Yeah. Were there any other arguments out there that folks used? Brian. So I said I need three more pieces to get to a hole on that side. And I need... Everybody on the point which side he's talking to. <laughs> Thank you. And I need uh, five more pieces to get to a hole on the ninth side. How many people think that's a promising start and, and you could finish it the very end, right? He gave us the, the crux. All right, cool. So, Fran. I was going to ask a question. I wonder if that always works if the numerators are not the same. No? The numerators. So someone saying no. <laughs> I, I, I was just going a whole new route. Are we ready? I was just saying you could turn them to decimals by device. How many people are really good at doing long division of decimals in their heads? Not me. She must no, be. No, no, no. Two, two people are. I'm not, so I wouldn't choose, but you could, yeah. So ask your question again that you asked about Brian's strategy. So I'm wondering if, if we're looking at the number of pieces to get us to one, does that only work if the numerators are the same? Talk to your people at your table about that. How about, let's see a hand signal. Do you think if the numerators are not the same and you're looking at the distance to one, how many pieces to one, would that always work? Show me a yes or a no. Oh. Okay, so that makes, so that's, that's an interesting strategy, but we have to qualify it, okay? Because we're going to test it out. We tested it out and talked about it. So when kids start to bring up strategies about their understanding and you go, I don't know about this one, test it out. Test it out and see if kids can come up with counterexamples, see if they can make a good argument on why or why not. Okay, so I have another question. Not there. <laughs> so I'm wondering... So you're saying these are around one half. Which one's closer to one half? No paper? Which one's closer to one half? Think about it. Talk to your buddies about it. 
All right. We have some interesting discussion going on. Raise your hand if your table said, you don't have to take responsibility, if your table said they're equidistant from one half at any point in your conversation. Okay. So you changed your mind about it? Ah. So who would like to construct an argument or tell us their thinking, especially if you changed your mind? Because usually when we do this with teachers, we get a lot of equidistant. Or kids. Or kids, or grandparents, or district people. We get a lot of equidistant, okay? So why would you change your mind? Because that sounds pretty sensible. Anybody? Over here? Tom, I'm going to let your buddy, okay? So, Nikki? Well, 0.5 of, uh, if you just look at it, there are 0.5, but 0.5 of a seventh is a larger than 0.5 of a ninth. Everyone stop. Raise your hand if you understand what she just said. Not every hand is up. Say it again. When you're talking, when you're look, just comparing, your, it's 0.5 away, 0.5 of a seventh on the first one, one seventh, the distance. You're talking about a seventh piece, 0.5 of that. On the, the ninth, one ninth, 0.5 of a ninth is smaller than 0.5 of a one seventh. Right now, tell your buddies, because she's breaking a math rule. How cool is that? She figured out the equivalent fraction to one half and sevenths and ninths. Talk to your buddies about, ooh, someone just made a noise over there. They went, oh. Talk to your buddies about that. What is the equivalence in sevenths? What is the equivalent in ninths to one half? Talk to your buddies about that. Break the rule. Let's be, throw caution to the wind. Just whisper, whisper into your hand like this. What would be the numerator in sevenths if you're making an equivalent fraction to one half? Everyone? Three and a half. That's breaking a rule. How cool is that? What would be the numerator in ninths if you're making an equivalent fraction to one half? Four and a half. Four and a half. Let's break rules, that's pretty cool. Yes, you can't write that down. Math protocol says you can't do that, but you can think it. No one can stop you from thinking it. Well, oh look, he's going, do they really say that? I'll get you a letter, a documented letter, okay. Um, so, so teachers will say, well, they're half away, so they're equidistant, but you're gonna go right into comparing that half. Half of what? So does a half of seventh equal a half of a ninth? No. So let me show you what you're doing, if I can find it. That's what you're doing. Can you look at the number right there? This is a third grade standard. Now we got a little dicey with it, but we compared two fractions with the same numerator. We did that. And then we kept going, recognize that comparisons are valid only when the two fractions refer to the same whole. And you bumped right into that. You said, well, they're both a half. And we said, mm, are they half of the same whole? Nope. They were half of a ninth and half of a seventh. So what we just did in that little, little tiny 10 minutes on fractions, 15 minutes on fractions, is build your conceptual understanding of fractions. Raise your hand if you learn fractions by rules. That's what I did. I just know a lot of fraction rules. But now the Common Core is saying, no, 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 we have to understand fractions. We have to have fraction sense, if you will. Questions or comments? Yes. Could you explain that math rule that we broke why you can't have three and a half sevenths? Because just mentally I was thinking if you have seven pieces and I share it with somebody and we each get three and a half, are you saying it would be 3.5 sevenths or? Well, first of all, this is a guy who did it yesterday or the other day in his class. Yeah. You said that was breaking a rule. I heard you say it. Okay, <laughs> Debbie, go. Well, the way you said three and a half sevenths, that would be officially called the complex fraction. That's okay. When you say 3.5, Sevens, that's when people start caring. But they are both representing the same quantity, right? So, And it's just really a norm, if you will, 
But you can think about it. You can find a half wherever it lives, wherever it's hiding. Your students can find one half wherever it hides. And sometimes you may write it down and break a rule. Sometimes you may not. But it's this whole idea is that I don't have to multiply by the big one to find my equivalent to one half. I know that numerator is half of the denominator every time I have an equivalent fraction to one half, every single time. That's understanding what one half is. Okay? Other questions? Oh, Debbie. <laughs> it's okay. I would have gone over there where you were looking. So how many fifth and sixth grade teachers that work on ratios and proportional thinking think kids actually looking at sevenths and t trying to figure out what would half be, even if I was doing sevenths, is a good idea for that proportional thinking? Yeah, that's a, that's a really nice thing that we didn't always used to do. What we're going to do next is we're going to just do sort of a little... Um, a little show and tell about choose three ways and about another quick little strategy. And we're going to show you um, some classroom video. So what we want you to do is put your, nope, we're not going to go there. We're going to have to switch over on the computer. We want, um, while Debbie's doing that, we want you to put your thinking cap on for two things. One, as a routine implementer in your classroom. Because choose three ways, think, pair, share, this other uh, structure I'm going to talk about are really just routines that you have to get in place so kiddos can talk. And if you don't like choose three ways, that's fine. Don't use it. Use something else. But the whole idea is that this routine is no different than walking in line. You've got to practice. And you've got to do it every day. And the first day you do it, you want to say, I'm not doing that again. But you're going to do it again and again and again because you want kids to get used to that. I want to set this up for you. Um, what you're going to see is you're going to see a third grade class in the Robles School District. And um, this was in June of last year, so these kiddos are now fourth graders. This teacher practices this technique or uses this technique constantly. He loves choose three ways. He loves it because it gets, well, we'll talk about it. I want you to pay attention to what the kids are doing and how they're doing it. And I'll tell you kind of the back story when you ask questions about it. Um, you're going to see another very small technique that we didn't talk about called starts. And it's not rocket science. It's just this idea that have you ever given a problem out to a kid and you see a few just sort of sitting there going, uh-huh. That never happens in Elk Grove, huh? So what you'll see in this video is this technique called starts, where you let them work for about a minute or two, depending on the problem, and you are around the room, and you pick three kids on purpose to share only their start. No answers. You'll even hear the teacher say, I'm not interested in answers. I just want to see how you started it. And then the kids go back to work. Because then he goes right in to choose three ways. They go back to work, and he can now walk around and say, Debbie, you're having trouble starting? Use Kara Start. And so there's some support there. He's had huge payoff with this. Okay, this is a... Th yeah, click on the title. I don't know if that matters. There we go. Okay, so let me set this up for you. This is a third grade at uh, Glenwood School. The teacher's name is Mike Manley. He loves starts and he loves choose three ways. There are two little kids that are off task and they're off task for a couple of really good reasons. The one little boy near the door is supposed to leave to go somewhere and he doesn't want to leave. How cool is that? He doesn't want to leave math class. So you'll see him hanging around and we sort of ignore him. The other thing that you need to know is if you get seasick, I apologize for the video, okay? It was me and my buddies. I'm not doing the bad video, though. But it's me and my buddies trying to get sort of a snapshot of a classroom. And we are not Steven Spielberg, so we're just going to put that out there right now, okay? But I want you to watch because we want to have a discussion about how this compares to what you're trying to do, okay? ...for you to uh, work on. First thing we like to do is read it a couple of times. Mom, Mom, Dad, Samira, check your audience. 
real quick scan. seconds or a minute to get a start. Do not solve it. Just get a start. during this time because somebody had a mistake, but usually we don't let them talk during this time. You say 50 cents. What um, what do the circles represent, DeAndre? Okay, thank you. There's, there's one start. Thank you, DeAndre. Tell us what you did, Eva. Anybody have any questions for a question for Eva, Jeremiah? What What is those lines next to the um, to the um, the three Down here. Yeah. Equal. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And what is those lines on people's faces? Eva, these lines, Jeremiah. Those lines. Uh, it's because uh, that. The mother owes them, so I cut a line because oh. they, she oh. owes them $3.50. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Wait, I have a question. Wait, can I Do you have a question, you. Maya? Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, how'd you get three girls? Yeah. Yeah, you I was going to say, because two, because there's two sisters, and I drew an extra one I didn't know, but then I said girls rock, so I drew them all together. Oh, there you go. Put it flat. And then um, I that's how I, that and then I figured well they're get, uh, how did I get my five? So then I did two brothers and two sisters and then I 
And then after that, I put plus one because you, and right here I said you have to add the narrator, the person who is talking, and that makes three boys and two sisters, and three plus two plus five, so five. That's how I got my five. Um, um, three, because there's three brothers and two sisters. And right here, um, I did three times five and fifty cent three dollars times five and fifty cents times five. And I figured maybe that's a way how I can check my answer. And if I get the it right, then I got my answer right. How will you check to see if you got your answer right? Well, because um, thirty and five would make whatever number, and um, we're trying to see how much money how much money. She needs, we're not figuring out how much money they get, because um, we already know it says right here. And so I did three dollars times five, and that would equal how many dollars? And 50 cents times five, because you would figure out this answer first. Then you would have to um, do this and see how much you get, and then just like divide divide this part right here. Well, you would give them. Um, Why would you divide that part? No, I mean, then you would have to, uh, oh, then you would have to, like, add this part to, um, right here, uh, because you, you would actually have to divide it because you would have to see, um, you would have to add all of it, the money to there, because that's how much, that's to the total of money she has, and you're freaking out how much money she has to get. This is Tell me about those seven dollars. Why did you do that? Seven dollars? Mm -hmm. Seven dollars right there. Because three dollars and fifty cents plus three dollars and fifty cents equals the three and three equals six and five and five equals ten. So you add that ten and it equals seven. Okay. So I put a seven right here because these two equal seven dollars mm -hmm. and then I put a seven dollars right here because those two equal seven dollars and then I had to I had to add them together and I got fourteen dollars mm -hmm. and then I had to add the last three dollars fifty cents to the fourteen dollar fourteen dollars and then I got sixteen dollars fifty cents. Okay. I want you to think a little bit more about that last step. Because I agree with everything you've done, but I think you made a little bit of an error right there. See if we can find your little error. So now, the, now they're done, and these are the kids sharing their solutions. And there's that little boy. No, you could go, Debbie. And there's our little friend. the narrator. So I put $3.50 on the five kids. Then. I did repeated addition to to check my answer. So I found out that seven seventeen dollars and fifty cents is the answer. And to check my answer, I did multiplication. And I found the same exact answer for repeated addition. Eva? I agree with Benjamin because if you if you if you add it all together, he will get all, all zero zero because because of. Um, He'll get all zeros, and then if he added the other one, he'll get um, five, and that equals 50 cents, and two plus, and then if you add them all together, it'll equal $17. There's one more kid that's going to uh, share. Um, I agree with Benjamin and Eva because... Um, <laughs> Can you turn off the sound only? F so... This is what I like you to do, and we'll stop it when this kid, the last kid's paper um, comes up. This is at the end of a year of doing this, 
Okay, so writing has to come in pretty fast, especially at your grade level. And what you heard is they're trying to read their writing on what they're doing. They give one problem. One problem is choose three ways, just one. And they, he has to step out and he has to just sort of pick the kids that he wants their strategies to share. You can see some of the things that are important to him. So that's what I want you to talk to your neighbor about. What were some of the details you noticed? What were some of the things that you're starting to see emerge in your classroom or that you're working on? Um, or just your comments about this and we're gonna walk around and listen and then we'll stop and show you the last little boy's paper. And they use each other's names. I mean, that was a, a protocol he established day one. And it, it sort of makes you feel, it's kind of a cool feeling in there when you hear them say, I agree with Eva because, or I disagree. Well, yeah. I don't hear any side talking nope. or laughing. Or, yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah. he would not allow them to laugh. The wrath of Mr. Manley would come out. Yeah, so safety is a huge issue, you're right. Well, and even when um, they're quite close their thoughts and they're kind of rambling a little bit, nothing. No. I mean, yeah. Well, they're very patient we'll talk about day. that, yeah. yeah. But but he has, you know, this was June, whatever, right. but he's worked on certain things all year long. Yeah, yeah so we'll talk yeah. about that. Is there anyone who wants to um, say something they heard in their discussion or ask a question? Yes, Lisa. Okay, I'm running. We noticed that um, they didn't do the three choose ways as we thought the three choose ways was. Like he didn't ask them to do it three ways. When they Wait, were what do you mean? So they had multiplication as one way, repeated addition as another. So what were you? Right. We, I thought that they had to, each individual child had to show it three different ways. And, and most of them were showing at least two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So three ways is a pot, I mean, that's a tall order for a lot of kids. So you've got to do it all the okay. time. In fact, how many people have just got one way if they've tried it so far? Usually kids only can get one way at the very beginning. Okay. I have a question for you, Fran. Yeah, question. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> I know that's odd. Uh, when I was thinking about why I thought the name of this was called Choose Three Ways, I thought it was because me as the teacher was supposed to be in charge of choosing the three ways I wanted to get presented as opposed to oh, good the Lord. kids the kids actually having to do it three different ways. No, it's it's you're you're trying to push flexibility of thinking. That's why you want three ways. Now he did not show too many kids who had a picture. I'm sort of disappointed about that. That's the only thing about this that there was there was some organization that you saw at first where kids were organizing like the kid to the 350. Remember that picture they drew? But other than that, we didn't see any bar models, but that's where all this could come in. Yes. Here, I got it, friend. You stay there. Well, anyway, uh, we have a question as far as how Keep often Keep hitting that. That's a long it, it takes about 20 minutes. Oh, we didn't hear you. It takes about 20 minutes. Um, and so he'll do shortened versions of it where it only takes about 10. He does it practically every day. One day a week, I know he, he makes it a bigger problem and he elongates it. So one day a week, it's a longer thinking. But he's doing it every day. Yes, question over there. Where? Where's the I question? I got it. Thanks. Never mind. Excuse me, everybody, for bashing you as I go through. Do the students have access to manipulatives? I noticed yes. no students yes. got up and had manipulatives. Yes, yes. So if they want to use manipulatives, they're there, they're on their table, no different than a pencil. But a lot of kids for this problem did not do it. They're really good at drawing pictures. They, they're, they're pretty good at that. Someone in the back talked about how quiet it was and there was no laughing, no side conversations. Mr. Manley, for as nice as he is, is just a tyrant if you make the environment unsafe. And he knows that if you're laughed at once or you observe somebody getting laughed at, you may not participate. So he just polices that like you would not believe. And that, that really gets put in place at the very beginning of the year. So by this point in time, we're, we don't see it very often. Yes. Yeah. What would that sound like? Duallys. 
So I, I, one thing I noticed was the kids would say, I agree with so-and-so yes. because, and that, that's really nice, and that's obviously been practiced. Yes. Um, and that shows respect, right, for their thinking. So do right. they do the same thing and say, I don't agree, yes. I, I disagree, yes. In fact, and they I, didn't, I didn't hear that, but right. it would be, you know. And I didn't edit this, but there was some disagree disagreeing, and they do say the name. No dissing, just disagreeing. <laughs> and they do say the name, because that's really important. The other thing, I don't know if you, if you noticed that the first little girl who brings up the idea of narrator, um, he says, check your audience, and she does this. Because in that classroom, when you speak, you expect to be listened to. And they will stop and call out the names. They'll say, Scott? I mean, not meanly, just, oh, wait. You know, the teacher thing. Oh, wait. You know, um, but they really have this expectation that whoever is speaking gets that respect of listening. Hey, Deb, you get I got yours. one. Okay. Well, so when we were out in classrooms, we saw a couple of classrooms that had uh, small little look like book mic bookmark sized cards, and on it were some sentence stems for students like "I agree with because." or I disagree because, um, for them to participate in, in how they could ask their neighbor or a question. So it was kind of an interesting little uh, support for kids to talk. Okay, oh, we're at time. Um, so as you walk out, I want you to contemplate something that you're gonna try tomorrow that will enhance your Choose Three Ways experience. Thank you.